sometimes I listen to BBC Radio 1 just to make myself feel youthful. And on The Breakfast Show, hosted by none other than Greg James, he lets people voice their unpopular opinions. You know, the sort of thing like uh, somebody might say, I love Hawaiian pizza, clearly wrong. Or, I don't like Hugh Laurie, obviously wrong because the man's a national treasure. Well, here's my unpopular opinion in car terms. I've never really been much of a fan of the otherwise very popular Golf R. Slightly awkward because this car belongs to Glenn, who's just behind the camera. Sorry, Glenn. Anyway, now there is a new Golf R. So, will that change my opinion? Now, obviously, I don't think the Golf R is a bad car. Far from it. It's a very good car, and I totally get why people buy one, because, well, £300 a month on a lease deal, you'd almost be mad not to. But, dynamically, they just uh, never quite floated my boat. I was always more of a fan of the GTI, to be honest. It just seemed more interactive and engaging. But this new Golf R, well, this is meant to be more interactive and engaging. Under the bonnet, it has got the familiar turbocharged four-cylinder EA888 engine in Evo 4 guise, delivering 316 brake horsepower at 6,600 RPM and 310 pounds-foot of torque from 2,100 RPM. This makes it the most powerful Golf ever produced, although it does weigh 90 kilos more than the GTI Club Sport, so the power-to-rate ratio is almost identical to that car. Of course, the reason for the extra mass is that it's got twice the number of drive shafts and sends its power to all four wheels. And as a result, 0 to 62 miles an hour takes just 4.7 seconds. Top speed, well, that's 155 miles an hour or 168 if you get the performance pack. As with all the Mark A Golfs, there's no three door option, it's five door only, and this only comes with a DSG, no three pedal option either. In terms of the chassis, well, this is 20 millimetres lower than a standard Golf. That's even lower than the Club Sport, which was 15 millimetres lower. But the big news is what's going on in the rear axle. Back there, there is a new torque vectoring differential, with clutch packs that are capable of sending 100% of the available torque to the outside wheel. It's akin to what we've seen on such cars as the Focus RS. Spring rates are also up by 10% compared to the previous model, and there is more negative camber at the front. This has also got a lighter front subframe and the steering is slightly quicker as well. Steering overall feels just slightly softer to me, but it's definitely more responsive. That front end is just much keener to get into a corner. It really is quick, this car. Power and torque obviously haven't gone up that much, but my word, it can cover ground. Not only does the engine feel more powerful, it also feels smoother in the way that it revs compared to the previous generation. Of course, part of the Golf R's huge appeal is that it's so usable every day. You get into it and it automatically defaults to sport, but put it into comfort and it really does relax and copes with the worst of the road conditions very, very well. Something else you also want to change as soon as you get into the car every single time is the lane keep assist, which you do by a little button on the end here and then pressing OK here. So it's not too complicated, thankfully. When you find yourself on a good piece of road, though, you'll want to put it into, well, one of the race settings, or maybe individual, but actually, drift, we'll leave that for the moment, but special, or Nürburgring, that's the one that I've been using most, and it does seem to work extremely well on British B roads. It just relaxes the suspension, but keeps everything else taut and responsive. And yeah, it's the one for me, I think. Just on the way into corners, you can feel it. Just keener to work the rear end. Up over the top here, goes light over the crest then. Yeah, it's just more engaging than out of here. You can feel out of there how it chucks all the torque to the outside rear wheel. The DSG box, incredibly smooth, almost arguably too smooth, but yeah, you can't really criticize it for that, can you? These paddles, great because they're different to the GTIs in terms of they're not the little things down there, they're not apologetic anymore, but the actual action of them is just, it's a little bit soft. You think, given that if somebody's using the paddles, if they're not just leaving it in auto, it would be nice to have an action that, I don't 
don't really require a huge amount of effort. You're just a bit like a bit more positivity to the way they react. Lots of buttons on the steering wheel as well. On this side, I like the one that is R on it, a little blue R, nice and easy to find and brings up the menu options here. Works very well. On this side, well, there's the heated steering wheel button, which is in the same position as the R one on that side, but for some reason I find it just, well, quite easy to activate without realizing it. You go around a corner and your hand just sort of seems to roll in and before you know it, warm hands, curious. The heated wheel is, of course, part of the winter pack, which brings me on to the hot topic of options. Now, this car costs £39,295 on the road, basic. But this actual car costs rather more than that because it has some specific options, namely the R Performance Pack, which is yours for £2,000. It brings the 19-inch Estoril alloys. It also gives you, importantly, the Drift and Nürburgring special modes on here so you you want that really because that's kind of what this car is about you also want the dynamic chassis control because that gives you the full option and gives the real sort of bandwidth to this car in terms of sort of its, its damping so that's another 785 pounds now this car has the akrapovich titanium exhaust a little bit of an extravagance i realize but Equally, if you like driving, it does make the car sound an awful lot better. You get a few nice pops and bangs. It's just, it's a nice thing to have, but £3,100 to you. Then we add other things like a rear view camera, £300. Head up display, £625. The uh, winter pack, fairly essential in the UK because, you know, heated seats, a heated windscreen. That's another £270. The Harman Kardon um, 12 speaker system, which is a nice thing because it's an everyday car and you think, oh, long motorway miles yes it would be nice 625 pounds and then proactive occupant protection i'm not actually quite sure what that is but it's only 140 pounds color and trim well the lap is blue paint which is pretty much a golf R staple isn't it that's yours for 755 pounds the sum total of all that 47,895 pounds nigh on 50,000 pounds for a golf R and that's quite important because it puts in a range of other things. Things like Mercedes AMG A45 or BMW's M2 Competition, both of which are fabulous to drive and don't force you to use touchscreens. Actually, the touchscreens, you know, they work fine. It's not like the ID3 where they seem to be recalcitrant and you have to stab at them lots to get them to work. It's just that things like ESC off, hidden in lots of menus, it's frustrating like that as an operating system. One of the things I do rather like inside the R is the Sardegna cloth interior, which takes a leaf out of the GTI's tartan upholstery book. Rather Ramsey blue hunting, I think you'll agree. I do like that Akrapovich exhaust as well. It does sound really good. The little pops and bangs, it's not too much, but it just does give it a character. I don't think overall this actually sounds quite as good as the old Golf R. I remember that being a bit more sort of, it's a bit more sort of Subaru boxer about it almost, but the Akrapovich exhaust is definitely, I think, worth having if you can stomach the 3,000 pounds. It's just more engaging, and I love the fact that when you get on the throttle, it's not just giving you traction, it's actually giving you a few options in terms of steering the car. Of course, there is a setting that will exaggerate this even more. Drift mode automatically puts you into ESC Sport and you really can feel it chucking all the torque to the outside rear wheel. So you come into a corner like this and it will, on the exit, do little drifts. I'm sure it will appeal to some and I get why it's there. I mean, why wouldn't they put it in? But the Golf R doesn't feel like it really needs the drift mode. Certainly not on the road. It just over eggs the pudding. The R feels more pleasingly rear biased in its standard race or Nurburgring settings. It's amazing how it deals with that rough bit of road. Nurburgring setting, you can really tell they have softened the suspension an awful lot. It's almost all the way down to comfort, I'd say. This really is now much more my sort of Golf R. A much more interactive, adjustable four wheel drive or all wheel drive system but still with all the usability.
I'd even go so far as to say that I might switch my allegiance for this generation from the GTIs to the R. The only fly in the ointment, apart from some of the switch gear, is that rather hefty price. Here's hoping for some of those fantastic lease deals. Oh, I've got hot hands again. I've turned the heated steering wheel on again. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for watching. If you haven't seen our review of the GTI Club Sport, then do check it out. And please do subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. It really does help us and we're pushing for a million subscribers as soon as possible. Thank you.